I was a bright-eyed, optimistic 24-year-old when I started in development. I had no clue what the journey ahead would be like when I was assigned to the position of development associate, but I quickly started to doubt where my life was headed. Then something happened that would alter what I believe for the next 37 years. Stay tuned to learn what I wish I'd known before I started in development. It was 1984 and I was just a few years out of college and I had a handful of graduate level classes under my belt when the HR department of my nonprofit employer sent me a letter notifying me of my assignment. For all the staff in our organization, spring was the time you were notified whether you would be staying in your current role or whether you would be assigned to a new position or even a new location. That year, my wife and I were living in Lubbock, Texas, working on campus. We discovered we were assigned to our then headquarters in San Bernardino, California. A relocation caught us by surprise, but then I learned that I had been assigned to the Office of Development. I didn't know whether that was land development or what. I had no clue that what I'd be doing was raising funds for the entire organization. Working on a campus, it had been a very relaxed setting, wearing jeans or shorts all day. The next role called for me to work in an office in a suit with 124 others whose sole responsibility was to wake up every morning and see how much they could raise to accomplish the mission that day. To say that was an adjustment would be the understatement of the year. But with a degree in government, I had taken my share of marketing, public relations, and public speaking classes. I was originally headed down the path of being a politician until I received what I can only explain as a higher calling and joined my current employer. I assumed that development required some type of sales and marketing experience and the ability to work well with people was important. Once again, that was an understatement. Two months into the new assignment, I found myself in Dallas, Texas, sitting in a workshop as part of a development conference thinking, this is some kind of a terrible mistake. I had no interest in what the speaker was explaining to us about tracking direct mail responses and adding motivation codes to envelopes. That was a Sunday afternoon. And after that class, I immediately ran out across the highway to the Galleria Shopping Center and into the crowded parking lot. And for two hours, I circled the parking lot grousing about this incredible mistake that had been made. I would call this wrestling with God. I was physically and emotionally exhausted. At that point, I believe God was saying to me, not in an audible voice, but in my mind, are you done complaining and criticizing what you're doing? Are you finally ready to trust me for this decision? At that point, I let out an audible sigh and essentially surrendered the decision. A great peace came over me as I went back to the conference and I never looked back. And I never again regretted a day of being in development. When people ask me if I enjoy what I do, I often say, this is exactly what I was born to do. There truly is nothing I'd rather be doing in, with my life. I've been to cities and hotels that people only dream of going to. And I've gotten to meet presidents, politicians, leaders of countries, and leaders of major corporations that I never would have met had it not been for this opportunity to be in development. And I've learned many valuable lessons that I want to share with you now. Lesson number one, development is about relationships. To succeed in development, you need to understand what motivates people to give. And that means gaining a better understanding of people's interests and desires. I learned that by having conversations and asking questions, I'd learn a lot about people. Too often, nonprofit leaders go into meetings with a sales pitch and could care less what the current or prospective partner thinks or believes. They have an agenda that includes getting their message across no matter what. Now, don't get me wrong. It's important to have a message to convey and give an opportunity to participate through giving to your organization but you must start by first listening. You might hear some things that, you, that will help you alter the message you are planning to share. I've mentioned before the story of a colleague who in the early stages of the internet met with a couple and came in guns blaring, sharing all the successes of a website we had created only to find that this couple thought the internet was evil and destroying the very fabric of our society. Needless to say, the remaining time with them was agonizing. 
that was coming in with an agenda before truly listening to the thoughts and the feelings of the donor. Truly successful leaders listen more than they talk and are generally interested in what the donor has to say. And that means spending more time friend raising than fundraising. I've talked about the difference between transactional and transformational relationships. Transactional relationships are built on getting something from someone. Transformational relationships are built on a concern for someone. As I started to genuinely listen to people, and donors know the difference between genuine concern and manufactured concern, I began to really enjoy what I heard. People shared their deep affection and love for our organization and mission. I heard from people who were interested in changing the world for the better and really making a difference in the lives of individual people. I began to fall in love with these people. I met and saw my place as an advocate for helping them best utilize their gifts to make a difference. I realized that I found energy in these conversations and developed deep and meaningful friendships with these people. Lesson number two, helping others win means that we win. In the early years, I selfishly went into meetings trying to convince people to give to our cause, and I got people to agree to do so. But somewhere along the way, I learned that helping them get what they wanted helped me get far more than what I ever wanted or dreamed. My whole perspective changed as I listened to what they needed and desired. And trust me, many of your donors have great burdens and great dreams to accomplish a lot with their gifts. As I found what those dreams were, I started to look for ways how their dreams intersected with our mission and goals. And where those dreams and our mission intersected, that's where they won and we won. Putting them first in their desires showed them that I genuinely cared about them and wanted to accomplish great things together. And when our dreams and missions don't intersect, well, I looked for ways to help them accomplish their dreams, even if it meant directing them to other organizations who could do those things better than us. And even though that surprised people that I directed them elsewhere, they really saw that I genuinely cared. Think back to the movie classic, Miracle on 34th Street, when the main character, Chris, playing Santa, directed Macy's customers to Gimbel's because they had a product in stock or were at a cheaper price, some executives thought he was crazy, but the customers loved him for it. Customers ended up buying more at Macy's because it was viewed that Macy's genuinely cared about their interests above profits. The same thing happened when I did that with our donors. The ones I directed elsewhere saw that I cared more about them than about the gift. And they eventually came back saying, hey, tell me about some of the things that you're doing. I believe I can help. Wow, we win when they win. Lesson number three, people give to people justified by the cause. It might surprise you, but I believe that people care more about relationships than they do about dollars and relationships more than accomplishing goals. Don't get me wrong, outcomes and results are critical and we'll talk about that later. But if we can put a face to an outcome, that's the winning combination. It's nice to give partners facts and figures, but knowing that even one life was changed forever as a result of their gift, that's when our partners or donors experience true joy and feel they are making a difference in the world. It's why adopted child programs and missionary support programs do so well. People feel as though they really get to know someone whose life has been changed because of them. A face and a name is important, but when someone actually gets to meet who they adopted or support, that truly seals the deal. It's critical that you look for ways to connect your donors to an actual person or a life that was changed. I believe this can happen with every organization, but try your best to do so. Perhaps your target audience is a woman who's been pulled into sex trafficking and showing their face could put them in danger. Or you work in a closed country where a person's involvement in your cause will put them at risk with their government or even their neighbors. Not sharing who they are may be the best, but even in that case, you could be creative and use an alias or even block out their face in pictures if possible. Even limited connection is better than no connection at all. 
When clued into these challenges to safety and security, donors understand what it means to put people at risk and they will not want to do that. But connecting donors to the lives that are impacted will yield a bountiful harvest for your efforts. Lesson number four, learn to be an advocate for partners or donors. As I mentioned earlier, I started out being a representative for our organization, pushing a cause or opportunity and eventually moved to being an advocate for our partners and donors. What this meant is that I began to advocate for the needs and desires of the partner or donor, and it eventually made me a better leader and made us a better organization. We started to look at every program from the perspective of the partner or the donor. We better scrutinized the way we did things. We improved the manner in which we evaluated our processes and procedures and essentially reported our outcomes. We learned to report back on the results. Instead of just doing things to get them done, we focused on doing things with excellence as if it were our money being used. We became stewards of the resources that our partners sent. We asked the tough questions of leadership like, specifically, how is this money used and why? It was the iron sharpening iron approach and being an advocate instead of just a representative made everything better. Lesson number five, treat people as partners, owners, or investors. I've mentioned in past videos that over the generations, starting with the current baby boom generation, that every generation has had a desire to be more involved in the workings of the organizations they support. They wish to have a say in the decisions being made and the direction the organization is heading. And that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. If anything, the desire to be more involved has gotten stronger. As a result, I learned to shift my mindset from thinking of the people who give to our organization as donors to thinking of them as partners, owners, or investors. A nonprofit is not a business with shareholders, but it's important to see the people who give to us as shareholders because they see themselves that way. That means they want transparency in the workings of the organization and a say in how their money's spent. That doesn't mean micromanagement, but it does mean they want you to pull them closer and include them in what's happening. And if possible, give them an inside track or a heads up before something is announced publicly just to make them feel special. Short-sighted leaders have been threatened by this request for greater openness and inclusion, but confident leaders have embraced this request. Frankly, I've always believed that people giving large gifts, especially mega gifts, have earned a seat at the table and a say in how their money is spent. Those leaders who have pushed partners away rather than embrace them have suffered the consequences. Partners sense when people push them away and will send their money elsewhere. Don't make this mistake. Embrace the partner. Embrace the inclusion. When people are included in the process with a program or project, especially decisions that are made, the more they will give to ensure the program or project succeeds financially. That's when overall success really happens. Lesson number six, remember to focus on the outcome. Too often in my early years, I spent time focusing on the process, how we did things, and shared that with our partners and donors when asking for a gift. But over time, I learned that partners or donors weren't as concerned about how we did things as they were with what happened as a result of the process. Were lives changed? How many lives were changed? And examples and stories of people whose lives were changed. Once again, just as in a publicly owned corporation, the shareholder is concerned about the return on investment. With a nonprofit, the partner or donor is concerned about the outcome and the lives changed, impacted, or turned around. So I didn't wait for people to ask for reports on the outcomes. I started adding those into the normal workflow and standard operating procedures. And partners and donors started expecting them and appreciating them. And those led to additional gifts, even unsolicited gifts. Reports don't have to be lengthy or full of stats and data, unless, of course, people ask for that, but very rarely do. Simply letting people know the outcome and results will be so refreshing and frankly unique for most organizations that you'll be an immediate hit with the partner or donor and will stand head and shoulders above the others. If I was starting all over again and assigned to do development for a nonprofit organization, 
I would love to know the information that I shared with you here in this video and believe that these lessons would not only give me an edge technically, but also motivationally. Take to heart the lessons in this video and implement most, if not all, over time. Development and fundraising are not a sprint, but a marathon. It took me 37 years to learn the lessons I shared with you today. So I understand if you can't implement all these immediately. Take one lesson per month or even one per year and develop a plan to assimilate each into your life and organizational culture. These are some life altering principles and the impact on your belief system. How you treat the people who give generously will be so tremendous that it can literally revolutionize the way you run your organization. At the very least, it will greatly increase your income, but fundamentally, it could alter the way you work to achieve your mission. It's my desire that these lessons have, a, have as great an impact on your life as they had on mine. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button and add a comment below. If there was something you especially liked, and be sure to hit the subscribe button and click the bell and click the all to be notified when the next video is released and join this rapidly growing community of nonprofit leaders committed to creating a culture of understanding of sound development principles and appreciation and love for those who give sacrificially to help us accomplish our mission. And as always, I wish you the best as you strive to increase your income and reach the goal of becoming fully funded. Thanks a lot. See you in the next video.